and welcome. My name is Amanda and I'm at Battleground Games and Hobbies in Abington, Massachusetts. Battleground is a game and hobby store in the greater Boston area with three stores, one here in Abington, one a little further south in Norton, and one up north in Saugus. I'm doing some painting today. I'm going to be painting figures from the Highlander board game. Um, this is a game that was kickstarted by River Horse Games uh, a little while back. And I already have a copy painted, that's my copy, and uh, one of my best friends, Sarah, I bought her a copy as well and told her I would paint it for her. So we're painting her figures. Um, so quick little thing. This is one of the finished figures from my copy. This is Iman Fasil. This is a guy, um, the board game, the Highlander board game is based on the movie singular. They only made one. Um, this is my Iman Fasil, and he's finished, he's sealed, he's done. Um, he's the guy that Connor beheads in the parking garage at the beginning. This is Iman Fasil from Sarah's copy. I worked on him yesterday. I have a little bit of detail work I'm going to do. You can see they're not exactly the same. I'm going to do some detail work on him today. Uh, some highlighting. I actually did his sunglasses differently. I did his uh, aviators a little bit differently. I did metallic frames because I realized they actually do have metallic frames. They're not like Ray-Bans. They're not black frames. So, um, yeah, his coat is a slightly different color. I went for more of a taupe rather than a gray. His tie is a little brighter, though I'm actually going to bring that down a bit. And his sword uh, is not as weathered. I, I went with um, more of a warmer wash on it. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I may change it. His hair needs a little bit of highlighting and touch-ups, so we're going to work on that. But for the most part, I'm using my figures, because they're already done, as the basis for what I'm doing with my friend's figures. So this is my Connor, and he's done. Got his uh, McLeod Tartan, he's got his Claymore, he's got his cloak, which is this weird loose woven stuff. I, I did a lot of research, a lot of like, staring and working through movie stills when I was painting my co copies of the figures, these ones. And he's got this like fox fur around uh, the top. So I was really paying attention to that. And if you really look at his like cloak, it's a very weird loose weave to it. It's, um, it doesn't look like it would be very warm at all. It's, it looks like it's more for dramatic effect than anything else. Um, so I've started to do that. You can sort of see the beginnings of how he's looking on Sarah's figures. So you can see he's got a base coat on his sword. He's got the green base of the tartan. I started doing sort of leather on his chest plate and belt um, and the sort of reddishness of the fur on his cloak. Um, I started working on the cloak. There's a lot of color uh, variation going on on the cloak when you look closely at it in the movie stills. There's like bits of white and bits of black and bits of brown and it's, it's a lot going on, honestly. So I had to do a lot of highlighting and dry brushing and shading and all sorts of work on it in mine. So we only really got to the base coat in one wash. So you can sort of see it's darker down the middle here. I sort of striped a wash into it because I don't want the whole thing washed. It's, it's not all going to have the same wash on it. There's going to be a brown wash. It, there's a lot. This figure, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, obviously, I went with a darker base for his hair. We're going to lighten that up a bit. He actually has sort of auburn hair in the, uh, in the movie. So we're going to run with that. So yeah, um, he is not He's not a simple figure, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, and we also did some base work yesterday on Ramirez. So we have my finished version. This is Ramirez in his peacock feather cloak. Also doesn't seem like it would be very warm, though his is at least lined. He has like a blue satin lining, if you look closely in the movie. Um, and he's got his sort of red uh, velvet clothing. It's got like gold 
uh, braiding and embroidery on it as a detail. He's got his katana, the ivory handle. Um, so we, we did a base coat of a burgundy on his clothes. We're going to brighten that up to a red, but I like starting with the burgundy. Um, it leads to shadowing and having sort of it be darker and dirtier and down near his legs uh, a lot easier. Um, we did a little bit of his white sort of shirt so he can show off his chest. Um, and we did a little work on his hat before I finished up and we also gave a, a base coat of teal on his cloak. There's a lot that goes into making the um, peacock feathers on his cloak actually look even remotely decent. So we're going to work on that. And then the other figure we're going to work on today is going to be the Kurgan. So this is my Kurgan. Um, he is all done. His sword is incredibly shiny. He takes good care of his sword, let me tell you that. Um, This is not a man who shirks on polishing. He is proud of how blindingly bright that is. I was really pleased with his cloak and how that came out. He's got his skull helmet with this sort of mane coming off of it, which is really cool. He's got a whole lot of skulls incorporated into his armor. He's got a skull on his knee. He's got skulls on his shoulders. He's got the skull helmet. It's ridiculous. I had to do a lot of research on him. You would not believe how hard it is to find a picture of the Kirkins' legs. They're just not, they're not clearly in um, images. And I really wanted to see how all of this broke down in terms of what is leather, what isn't, what's black, what's brown. Um, because while it, the sort of enduring image of him is that he's wearing all black, he's actually not. He's not wearing all black um, in the ancient stuff. His armor is, is bronzy and uh, warm. He is wearing a lot of black and a lot of gray, but that's not really the only color. Um, he's wearing a lot more all black in his modern day incarnation, which I do have a figure for because there was an expansion to this game, the Princes of the Universe expansion. And I do have that. I do. I will be painting that for my friend Sarah, but not today. We're not going to work on that right now because we have three more figures after this. We're probably not going to get to any of them today because I also have something else I need to finish up before we do that. Um, but we have two original characters. So we have Naminaga Minamoto. You can see her here. She's wearing a traditional kimono and obi. She's sort of, you can see she's like taking a blade out of her sleeve, very sneaky. Um, I love her. I love the character as written in the rule book because um, River Horse and the folks who made the board game um, and Studio Canal and all the folks involved in this, they rightfully realized that movie is a bit of a sausage fest. Just a bit. A lot of dudes. A lot of dudes. And um, despite the fact that Ramirez is supposed to be Egyptian, he's played by Sean Connery, who is definitely not from Egypt. So it's a lot of white guys. Um, so it, they wanted to sort of broaden things a bit, which I really appreciate. So they gave us Namanaga Minamoto, and um, she's got a whole story about it being taken on uh, as a new immortal by a wandering ronin, and the two of them basically traveling the countryside and trying to right wrongs and do good, and I thought that was really neat. She, she's got a re and then when he loses his head, she goes into seclusion. She basically goes into hiding. Um, not so much hiding because she, she doesn't feel confident, but because she's just sort of done with everything. She just doesn't want to deal with it. And when the time of the gathering comes, she comes back out as Amy Gray, and she also has a modern day figure in the expansion. So all of the figures, all of the characters that have figures in the base game have expansion, um, have a character in the expansion that is either their ancient version, like their original life version, or is the modern day version. So for example, we have Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod in this version. Um, in the expansion, we have Russell Nash. So he's wearing his jeans and sort of leather bomber jacket and his dad's sneakers because he's wearing his white 
sneaks. They look like they should be Velcro. They're not, but they look like they should. Um, so each character either has a modern version or an old equivalent, which I think is really neat. And it's not like the base game is all ancient versions because you have Iman Fasil. So he's definitely modern day. And you have Ramirez, and that's as, as modern day as he ever got, unfortunately. Spoilers for a movie that's, you know, decades old. But uh, this is what he looks like when he loses his head. So um, he doesn't have a modern day. What he has is an ancient where he's from ancient Egypt. And so that's the figure that's in the expansion is him in his clothes from ancient Egypt, which is really neat. Um, the other original character we have here is Talia. She is Mesoamerican. She's Aztec. And she is wielding a maquahuitl. It's a wooden weapon with obsidian chips wedged into the edges. It's really nasty. Um, and I greatly appreciate that she's wielding that. Must be a hell of a thing to keep clean. I gotta say that. Um, but she's got some jewelry on. There's some really cool, I mentioned this yesterday, visual storytelling in her jewelry, where this gold collar that she has on, this sort of necklace that's really like all across her front, it is actually far more elaborate in her figure in the expansion, which is her original life, her, um, her earlier life. It's a much more elaborate necklace, but it's definitely still the same necklace. So in my own sort of mind, my thinking is that she's been breaking pieces off of it and selling it for money um, and using that to, to fund whatever she's up to. Um, in modern day, she has turned to gun and drug running because she's sort of fairly nihilistic in the modern day. She was a lot of fun to paint. She's wearing camo pants. I, I honestly find camo really fun to paint. <laughs> it's not easy to paint, but gosh, is it fun. So yeah, I had a lot of fun painting her. She was really interesting. Um, I had to paint in a sports bra for her because uh, there's no way you want yourself popping out there when you're in the middle of a fight. And it's, that's just silly. Um, but yeah, she's great. Love her. She's really interesting. She's a very interesting character. Um, actually, I think I reversed these two. Yep. And finally, we have our last canonical character. We have Sunda Castigir. So this is modern day Castigir. Modern day Castigir is wearing this sort of white, he's like white scrubs sort of looking things. And it's just this white, nice, nice clean white cloth, which you can imagine gets spattered with blood. It must have been very visual. Um, and he's wearing in the movie uh, during the bridge scene where he's chatting with uh, Connor about the gathering, um, he's wearing this sort of over robe, a very light fabric, this very light orange and purple and cream, um, almost plaid fabric that's been woven together. And it's got like a little bit of a metallic. There are these two wider, uh, like broader white, off-white panels that go all the way down that are interwoven that have like metallic thread woven into them. Um, it's a really cool garment and it's a really cool fabric. It is uh, so hard to render in paint. Um, plaid is hard in paint because you can't do that weaving effect. The whole point of weaving is that you end up with, you know, things sort of like, uh, there we go. So you have things like that, um, where it goes over and under. There's no way to really do that in paint. You can't do it. Um, so it's sort of a matter of making like lots of cross hatches and stuff and not muddying it. And what I found was if I, if I tried to incorporate more orange into it, because the, the garment really is very evenly balanced. Every time I look at it, I'm like, well, is it an orange base? Is it a cream base? Is it a purple base? Um, every time I try to look at it and figure out like what the actual base color is, I realize there is no base color. It's all three colors woven together in fairly equal amounts. So unfortunately with paint, you kind of have to have a base color. I tried to incorporate more orange and it just looked muddy as hell. Because when you're dealing with orange and purple, you're already dealing with two secondary colors. So that's the thing. Um, 
Castigier does not, this is his modern day figure. His ancient figure is wearing like a frock coat and stuff. Uh, it's very, he's very foppish. I really love it. Um, so I need to find out from Sarah whether she wants her figure to have a powdered wig or not, because um, I found just enough proof of that either way, wig or not, could be um, argued. Now, before we get started with the Highlander figures, I am finishing something up for a friend. This is for my friend John. Um, John is, is frequently on our Friday evening board game streams. Hang on a second. Um, John is frequently on our board game streams. John is a very enthusiastic board gamer, which we love. And um, I painted his copy of Samurai Starship. Starship Samurai, sorry. Starship Samurai. This is the expansion, the Shattered Alliances expansion, which I finished painting a couple of weeks back and then never sealed. I never got around to sealing it. So I'm just doing the final coat of sealant on it. So these characters, um, these are giant mechs that the uh, you sort of play with on the board. You don't play as them, but I get, you get to claim them, I think. We haven't played yet. We will, I believe, be playing this game on our stream this coming Friday night, so 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, this coming Friday, we will be playing Starship Samurai with the Shattered Alliances expansion. So I want to get this sealed before we play with it. So I told John I would try and get that done today. So we're going to do that today before we um, dive in to the uh, into Highlander. Um, this was a really fun, the mechs from this game, the figures for this game, were so much fun to paint. I have one singular complaint about them, and that's that the figure for one of the characters is wearing this sort of over robe, um, this sort of, s why do you need robes on your mechs? That seems like a waste of fabric, and they're in space. They're not gonna billow space. Anyway, there's no wind. Um, anyway, yeah. So you end up with this, um, these fabrics on some of them. So like she's wearing this skirt. Why does she need it? There's another one where the skirt actually had this like scroll work on it. And I thought about doing it on this one. I had to freehand it with a paintbrush because um, it's in burgundy and I could not find a burgundy fine tipped pen that was tipped fine enough um, to do the scroll work. It was either just too wide or it wasn't permanent and it bled. I bought a pen that I thought was um, permanent ink and started drawing on the scroll work. And, you know, I started at one side and I was working my way around and working my way around and working my way around and I got to this side and realized it had started to spread all over. And I had to paint over it. Um, I actually, it bled through the paint because of course it's red and the paint on the skirt is white. So it bled right through, which was very frustrating. I had to seal it and then repaint it and then cry <laughs> quite a bit. Oh no, I got sealant on my pat, my mat. Um, so that was very, very frustrating because I had finished, I, I had a couple of mishaps with those figures that I feel really bad about because they aren't mine, they're John's. Um, the other mishap I had was misjudging. I painted them last summer and I misjudged just how hot it was in the back hallway where we do most of our like spray can work because the back hallway even though it's not super well ventilated it's also not an area where anyone has to hang out so you don't have the fumes sort of sitting in anyone's face and it does have a back door so um 
So we do, you know, if you're going to prime something with spray primer or you're going to seal something with spray sealant, um, you take it out into the back hall and spray it on, but then you sort of want to leave it back there because otherwise you bring it back in the store and it's like you just sprayed everything in the store and everything's stinky. So I left it out in the back hall for a couple of minutes and when I went to go get it, realized I had miscalculated and it was way too hot in the back of the store, um, in the back hall. And I had left them out there and the spray sealant had dried as like a mist, it's like a, a very um, opaque mist. So I had basically like covered them in, I had flocked them almost. Um, and I had to redo a whole bunch of them. I had to go back over their sort of top coats um, and redo a whole bunch of stuff for them. And it was intensely demoralizing. Not as bad as the worst um, crafting mishap I've ever had, which I don't think I will ever outdo. The worst crafting mishap I ever had was, it was a bad one. It was, it was a doozy. Um, my high school had a thing that seniors could do at the end of the senior, their senior year. You could apply for uh, your senior project. And your senior project was, um, you could apply to basically drop all or a portion of your senior classes, just the classes you were taking your senior year, finish them up early, like two months early, and work on a sort of big project instead. And I applied to do that. And it, what you could do as a project, um, some people did like academic research sort of things. Other people did, I don't know, crafts or I, I did a craft, it, which was, I don't know why they let me do it, but they did, so whatever. Um, you know, I was looking at applying to colleges as a prospective science student. I was looking at like marine science programs. Not what I ended up doing with myself, but that's what I was looking at for colleges at the time. And um, I applied for my senior project to be a quilting project. Goodness only knows, eh, private schools, what are you gonna do? I guess they sort of assume if you're going to this school, you probably are gonna end up making money. So you can take a couple of uh, months off and do some sort of dilettante sort of crafting project if you really want to. It's ridiculous. I benefited from it, but I, I fully own up that it's ridiculous. Um, but like people made movies and did like document, people did like dramatic stuff and people also did like documentary stuff. Um, I had a couple of friends who made a documentary about the Greenbush line for the MBTA. Um, which was actually interesting and informative. Kudos to them for making something legitimately useful. Um, there were other people who directed plays or designed sets, um, but they were people who were like, that was something they were super into. Um, there were other people who did like photo projects if they had been like photography students and really done a lot of photography classes and stuff. There were people who wrote um, and like put together like a poet book of poetry, like a chap book. Um, so all sorts of stuff. Um, but there were also people who did like painting and other people who did like research papers and stuff like that. And I applied to quilt. And the way I worded it was um, that it was a an important thing to me family-wise because my grandmother quilted and she was a grandmother that I didn't really get to know terribly well. I didn't um, I didn't get to be very close with her. She lived in another state, that side of the family and my side of the family. You know, she didn't even live in a state nearby. She lived several states away and I knew that she quilted. My family had several of her quilts but she also had gotten old enough that um, 
probably was never going to quilt again. And I wanted to learn how to quilt so that I could sort of carry that on. Have I quilted since high school? No. Do I want to pick it back up and do it? Yes. Do I have room in my apartment? No. But when I have room, I would like to go back to it because I really did enjoy it. I actually really liked hand quilting. Um, when most people think of quilting, they're thinking of the piecing of it. You know, you think of a quilt and you think, oh, it's something that has lots of, of patches all put together, right? No, not necessarily. Um, the the patches are the are patchwork. Patchwork is a style. Quilting is the stitches that bind everything together and actually make like they're almost like embroidery. They make a pattern of stitching, attaching the sort of top and bottom layer of the quilt, the back and the front together. So when you think of quilting, it, most people, like I said, think of patches and stuff. And yeah, that's, that's definitely part of making a quilt. But that's not the actual quilting portion of making a quilt. Um, that's the patching together, that's piecing. So piecing together is, is you know, also an absolutely an art form. Um, and very geometric and fascinating in a lot of ways. Um, I find how you can play with color in quilt piecing and achieve very different large-scale effects using the same basic layout, but choosing your color scheme and putting it together differently is really interesting. It's a very fascinating geometric challenge, which I think is really cool. Um, But the actual quilting part involves like either a quilting frame where you're holding, you actually um, wrap the quilt around rollers and use the rollers to pull it taut. So you have sort of, it's rolled like around a roller like this on one side and it's rolled around a roller like this on another side. And then you have the whole surface and you work pulling needle and thread. You can also machine quilt. People have um, big free arm quilters that come out. The, when you think of a sewing machine, you think of something about yay big or yay big. Um, quilting armed machines tend to allow for a lot more space between the body of the machine and the actual place where the needle is because you're gonna be bringing a large amount of fabric in around as you quilt. And you need to be able to turn it and play around with it because machine quilting, you're gonna be doing lots of curves and or straight lines, but you need to be able to pull a lot of fabric through. And they need to be heavy duty because they're going through two layers of fabric, sometimes multiple layers of fabric where the seams are, because um, then you're dealing really with like three layers of fabric and then batting and then another layer of fabric for the back. Um, so you need, they need to be pretty heavy duty, which is cool. Um, what did I just do with my brush? Ah, I put it over here. So, um, I applied to make a quilt and part of my application said that I was going to be designing the quilt pattern from scratch. I wasn't going to be using existing patchwork patterns. I was going to be making my own pattern and that the pattern would be telling a story because that's part of why quilts are so fascinating to me is that they they are um, a non-traditional storytelling medium. And I love non-traditional storytelling mediums. So I thought that was neat. And that um, the quilting pattern, the actual stitching would also be designed by me and be unique and that it would complement it and that I was going to do all of this. The piecing would be done by machine, but the quilting would be done by hand, which means an embroidery hoop because it was a three by three, uh, three foot by three foot space. That's a lot of hand quilting, let me tell you. And because I was doing it in small chunks, I was moving it around. Uh, looks like the bot is working, Andy. Um, 
as I was moving it around, um, I, I thought I had figured out where everything went. What I was doing was making a quilted compass rose, so like a nautical map compass. Um, and it has the compass rose in the center, and then I had waves around the middle. And then the edging, the corners and the sort of top, bottom, and left and right were the cardinal directions and the sort of northwest and so on. So I had north, south, west, east. Um, and then I was supposed to have like northwest. This is reversed on camera, but I promise you I, I am holding up the correct hint. Um, but yeah, yeah. I reversed them. I had north, and then if this was west, I had it as east. <laughs> I had to basically undo all of the east, easts and wests, and all four corners, all of the north, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. Um, and I discovered this when I took the embroidery hoop for off for the last time and went to start doing the edging. It was due on Monday morning at 8 a.m. <clears throat> I had to have it done and have it ready to put on, to like show to my mentor for the project and have her evaluate it along with all of my other like bits and pieces that went with it because I also had like a notebook and all my patterns and my test, um, my, my like sampler and I had to have basically everything ready to go and show her. So I was going to spend the weekend edging. I was like, I'm done. It's like Friday afternoon. I finished all of the directions. I finished all the letters. The lettering are, is done. I take off the hoop. I spread it out to start pinning up the edging and um, realize that I have put half the letters in the wrong places. And I'm going to need to rip out every single one of those hand-stitched letters and redo them over the weekend that I thought I was going to be able to spend finishing my edging and then doing um, like polishing up all of my notes and getting ready to put up the like display because I had to put it on display for a couple of weeks. No, no, I'm going to spend, I'm now going to spend the next two days restitching all of that and it hand quilting is just, it's a laborious process. There's a reason people machine quilt. <laughs> and that wasn't fun. So I basically said, and I had to rip them all out. And that's a laborious process too, because you don't want to destroy anything. You don't want to like damage the actual surface of the quilt. So yeah, that's what I did. And it was horrible. Um, I felt really stupid. Felt very foolish. Um, why wouldn't I have checked? Why didn't I check? Um, but I didn't. So, lesson learned. I mean, I was in high school. You have to learn these lessons sometime. So, um, But I learned it and I did get it done. I did get to turn it in on Monday morning. It was, it was fine. I'm actually bringing up a, I want a picture of the McLeod Tartan so that I can No, that's a good picture. I just basically want, um, I want a good picture of the tartan so that when I start to work on um, Duncan, because I do have um, my reference, but for something like a tartan, I'm gonna want uh, I'm really gonna want the specific like layout of the colors and everything. Cause it's got green, it's got a vertical green stripe, 
a vertical blue stripe, wide stripes, bordered with black, and then it's got the alternating green and blue going across, again bordered with black, and then cross-secting them um, are thinner stripes of yellow and red. So, yeah. I just wanted to make sure I'm getting the directional and the spacing right. But we're going to work on Iman Facile first. So here's our finished buddy. And here's the one we're working on. He's close. He's almost done. But yeah, I felt, I felt really foolish. So that's the worst crafting mess up I've ever had where like I had an enormous amount of work that went into it and I had been so careful about so much of it. Like I was careful about all my corners so that all of like my triangles, all my corners were nice and sharp. Um, the wave pattern for the um, for the sort of center quilting. I was so careful about that. I actually made a template so that I could chalk on the lines properly. Um, better. Um, I had been so careful. I had I had really been trying to be so good about it um, and precise and space things out just right. And there was so much measuring involved in all of it. Ah, and then I just blew it. It was very demoralizing. <laughs> so demoralizing. Oh well. So it goes. But yeah, so sealing um, the Starship Samurai guys and having to redo that, it's like, oh, well, it stinks, but I've done worse. I've messed up worse than this before. So not the end of the world, I guess. I'm pleased with how his sword came out on mine, um, but I think it came out better on Sarah's. I'm actually pretty happy with how he's looking. We're gonna do a little work on his hair, get his hair looking a little less monotone. Um, but yeah, I mean, no one is perfect at anything especially not like right out of the gate. We've all, you, there, every, all crafting is a learning process. What do we think about him? He's sort of blown out on camera. Um, let's see if I can get him to register a little bit cleaner. He's a very pale man. I think he does need maybe a little warmth on his lips. But other than that, I'm not trying to do a whole lot with his 
the rest of them. So hey chat, let me tell you about my new cat. He's so basic, yeah, he is the most basic. He's a Chad, not like a Chad Kelby sort of Chad, because we like him, but like a Gideon sort of Chad. Um, let me tell you about my new cat. <laughs> Let's have cat time. I have a new cat. She's awesome. And I love her. Her name is Clara. Um, Clara Kins, Clara Bell, Clara Butt. She's adorable and sweet and I kind of just want to snuggle her, but she's also incredibly skittish. Um, so I'm not snuggling her. You know what I struggle with? Natural lip colors. Um, like, when you look at people's actual lips, like, when you look, actually, look at this guy. He doesn't have a lot of lip going on. He's a... He doesn't have, like, a pursed lip sort of look. He is very blonde, though. My goodness. What a blonde man. Um... He's not even very ready. He's just very pale. He's just a pale dude. I guess his cheeks, I could probably add a little bit of warmth to them. So we used fair skin for him because he is so very, so very white. Um, we're actually probably going to use rosy for his cheeks. Because I don't actually want to do, like, highlight because I'm not trying to highlight. I'm not trying to go lighter. I'm trying to go warm. So we're going to mix. I'm going to do sort of a little custom skin tone for him. Um, but let's talk about my cat because I want to. Her name is Clara. We adopted her last Thursday. We went to the Quincy Animal Shelter and we... We've now had five cats, myself and Andy, um, as like a couple. Uh, Andy and I have been, my husband and I have been together for quite some time. Uh, since I was in high school, basically. He was a little older than me. And um, he had two cats when I met him, and then he still had them when we started going out. And then he still had them when we moved in together and started really living together. Um, there we go. I like that. That's pretty good. Um, and that was Zoot and Dragon. They were litter mates. He had gotten them from a mutual friend of ours whose cat had kittens. And what you need to know about Ebony, who was their mother, was that she was so small, so small. She was a very tiny cat. She was a really, really bitty. She was like, yay big. She was very small. So when Andy was um, talking with his friend and saying, you know, oh, I want a cat. And she was like, you should take two. Take two. Um, Andy was living with his sister at the time. And his friend said, take two. They're going to be small. Look at Ebony. And so Andy took two. He took a little tuxedo guy. Um, and that was Zoot. And then he took dragon who was the runt of the litter and um, 
He was like, yeah, I'll take the runt of the litter. That'll be fine. And then it uh, turns out, we don't know who dad was, but he must have been real big. Because while Ebony was a bitty little nothing of a thing, um, both Zoot and Dragon were gigantic. Um, Dragon standing up on his hind legs, his head would have come up to like here. His head cleared our kitchen counters if he stood up on his hind legs. Like, he, he was like a dog. Um, he was a dog-sized cat. He was a really big boy. And we loved him, loved him so much. But he was definitely, um, he was a big, big cat. And he, um, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to have to use. Um, yeah, he was a big boy. Interesting. He was just a really big cat. And he knew he was big. He knew he was too big to be up in the air. So he didn't like being picked up or held. That, that freaked him out. He got very nervous about that sort of stuff. Um, which I understand. That's... That's nerve-wracking. You're, you're a big cat and someone's picking you up. Terrifying. There we go. Um, so he never liked that. He, that was, that always made him intensely nervous. So we understood that. So we didn't, we didn't do it frequently. Um, we tried not to pick him up. And uh, Zoot hated everyone except my husband. He just wasn't a super friendly cat. We didn't really need him to be. Yeah, he and Andy were friends. And that was all they needed. That was really all they needed. What do we think? You look good. I think he's done. I don't think I need to do much more with him. So he's going to go over here to dry. Um, so that was Zoot and Dragon. And Andy had them when I met him. And then while we were living in Pennsylvania, when I was in college, he, um, we made some friends um, who worked with Andy. Andy was working at a video store in the area. And there was a guy who worked there and we became friendly with. And he was a neat guy. Um, he eventually got married and we liked both him and his wife. They were really neat people. We enjoyed hanging out with them. And then they moved to Idaho and they had two, three cats. Excuse me. They had two adults, Squeaker and Leela, and one kitten, Faith. And they realized that they were going to have to drive cross country to Idaho. Um, they did not want to have to drive three cats cross country to Idaho. That seemed like stressful for everyone involved. So they, um, they found new homes for two of the cats. They figured that Faith was the kitten. She would probably get over the trauma um, <laughs> of being moved, but she was also small. And so they figured they could sort of block off a space for her and she would be happy with it. Um, and they, they could, you know, have her in a hotel room and just shut her in the bathroom. Whereas trying to shut three cats, two of which were full-size adults, and Leela was not small. She wasn't as big as Zoot and Dragon, but she was not a small cat. Um, trying to shut three cats into a bathroom in a motel or something was just gonna be horrible. So um, one of their relatives, I think one of Becca's relatives took um, Squeaker, who was a long-haired gray and white cat, whom I don't think I ever saw full-bodied. Pretty sure I only ever saw Squeaker's nose or tail. Um, Squeaker was very shy. Very nice from all accounts, but very shy. And they were taking Faith, so we got Leela. 
and Leela was a um, tabby. She was a tabby cat. And she had come out of a three cat household and as far as we knew and as far as we were told, she was fine with that. You know, she was fine with Squeaker. She was fine with Faith. Okay, we've, got, we've still got the two boys, but she's coming and they're bonded and they're older and they're both male. So she's probably not gonna get along great with them. Um, Zoot she avoided, which was probably to her benefit because Zoot, Zoot would have messed her up if she had gone after him. Dragon on the other hand was a big affable lump. He was just a sweetheart. And um, and yet you were around for the whole quilt thing, Andy. <laughs> we have been together for a long time. Um, but Dragon was a big affable lump. He was an absolute sweetheart of a cat. And he, he didn't want to fight. He just wanted to hang out. And Lila went after him. Um, she knew an easy mark when she saw it, and she went after him. And I get it. Like I, I don't, I don't hold any ill will towards her, um, because I know now that, as it turns out, she should have been an only cat. But we didn't really realize this until after we not only lost Suit and Dragon but lost our, our other cat, Adric. Um, when we lost Suit and Dragon, um, Dragon had been my baby. Dragon got me through a lot. Dragon, Dragon was my rock for a while. And he, um, when we lost him, and then we lost Suit not too long after him, um, that was really hard. And so not too long later, we went and adopted another cat. And we went into the shelter thinking, we want to get a cat that will get along with other cats. We want someone friendly. We want someone um, young. We went when with every intent to find like a two to four year old female that would not question Leela's authority in the apartment. We came, Leela was eight at the time. We came home with a six-year-old male <laughs> because he claimed me. He reached out a paw and grabbed me and then would not stop nuzzling my hand and started to purr. And this was a cat who had been very standoffish, wasn't thrilled about being handled. Um, and so the fact that he grabbed my, my arm and then nuzzled my hand and purred it was a big deal. We came out of the adult cat room and we were like, yeah, we're going to take Charlie. And the shelters said, really? Char really? Okay. They were very shocked um, because he just didn't open up to people. He wasn't a cat that sort of, there were a bunch of outgoing cats and we'd been playing with them and we, no, we took him. And within a couple of days, he was up on the bed hanging out with us and never wanted to leave my side. Um, he was a good boy. He was a really good boy. I think it's time for Tartan next. Um, he was my, my good, good boy. I loved him. Uh, I still love him. And he, he was just a sweet, sweet cat. That's all there was to it. He was just a sweet boy. And he, um, he wanted love and attention. And when I lost him, it was really hard. Losing him was really difficult. Um, and I lost him two years ago. God, two and a half years ago. Because I lost him in December, right before Christmas. Isn't that great? That's what you want, is to lose, lose your best bud right before Christmas. Isn't that what everyone wants? Um, 
I still miss him terribly. And uh, all of a sudden, and she hadn't, I, I don't remember her being this way after we lost Suit and Dragon, so I don't think it was obvious at the time, but suddenly Leela was the most chill cat in the world. She went from being just a pest to being just blissed out all the time. Oh, hanging out on the bed? Yeah, all right. She didn't yowl at me, no swiping at me. Um, she wanted attention from me, which was really unusual. She was very much Andy's cat. And suddenly she's coming to me for attention and she's hanging out and she's being really sweet. Um, and we realized, oh, this is a cat who needs to be an only cat. And we didn't realize that early enough. If we had realized that early enough, when we lost Suit and Dragon, it would have been really hard for me. But when we lost Suit and Dragon, I probably would have just said, you know what, let's just keep her for however long. And it would have been a good long time because um, she lived to be almost 20. So, <laughs> we had her after Zoot and Drag, after we lost Zoot and Drag, and we had her for another 12 years, which is wild. But, um, we did, we lost her, um, back in February, and we didn't just want to drop another cat into the house. Um, we wanted to really make sure that we had made our peace with Leela. Bring up the plaid. Um, and that we knew that it was the right time. And so this week, we wanted to make sure we had time to get to know a new cat. So this week, well, last week, we went on down to the Quincy Animal Shelter. And we asked to meet a bunch of cats. And we... We met a whole bunch of cats. And uh, they sort of talked to us about a bunch of them, wanted us to get to know them a little bit. So we did. And they had a bonded pair, Pixie and Monster, who were very outgoing and really wanted to get attention. And they had um, a couple of single cats. They had an older cat named Cinnamon, um, who I really hope finds a home. She's an absolute sweetheart, and she needs to be in someone's home. Um, they have Felix, whom we didn't meet, but I hope he finds a home, like a permanent home, too. He's in foster home right now, because he's got some medical issues. Um, So yeah, they have a lot of a lot of good cats. Like Midnight. And Midnight, um, all black, big, polydactyl. So that's going to be trouble. Um, and then we met this tiny little tuxedo. She's only one year old. And as soon as I saw Andy with her, I thought, oh, I know who we're taking home. I 
I know who's coming home with us. And sure enough, that's who came home with us. And they were like, she's got some behavioral issues. She's very nervous. She's on anti-anxiety meds. You're going to have to be really careful with her. She's got, you know, her previous adopter had brought her back, which I, I have thoughts and feelings on, um, but had brought her back for being feral. talk about feral cats folks because when the shelter folks said that I was like "Ooh, is she gonna like be a biter like, what exactly is this gonna mean um, As it turns out, we think what it actually meant is she was a kitten. Because she's actually very sweet and friendly. And I got to rub her belly today. And there's absolutely no way that a feral cat would let me rub a belly. This may not be super apparent right now, um, but I am doing blue and green sort of striping. I may want a slightly, uh, the blue is, the blue and the green are not like the most distinct colors, I'll be, I'll be honest. It's a lot brighter when it overlaps. The green is a lot brighter when it overlaps. So we're gonna do a slightly brighter green in some places. Um, but there's no way a feral cat, she's not feral, she doesn't like being picked up. We haven't tried, but we, we've been told she doesn't like being picked up. Okay. That's fine. A lot of cats don't like being picked up. It's, it, being picked up is scary. Um, that's fine. So the blue and the green are more subtle colors than the yellow and the red. So the yellow and the red are going to end up being a little more distinct. Ooh, that was a little too much green. Let's wipe that off. Um, but she's not feral. And this morning I did get the pear. Let me tell you, that is like the biggest treat.
That's why I got belly rubs today, and it was great. Turns out she's real talkative. She wants attention and love.
That was a little bit more than I intended to get on there. Okay, I think that's I think that's pretty good. Um, you can tell mine is a little more subtle. There's also the creasing is a little more defined on this one. Um, I'm actually going to end up going over that with a wash, so that'll bring that down a fair amount. Um, so yeah, I think next we're going to work on his. Uh, I'll work on his cloak on the back, I think. I don't think Andy is watching right now because he's got a customer down there. I have a question for him though.
oops. I'm actually going to do a green wash on his uh, on his tartan. Or do I want to do a blue? Sorry about that. I think I want to do the, the green. Yeah, that's better.
I'm going to do some metallics on him, and then I'm going to let him sit for a little bit because all those washes need to dry before I do much more work on him. I don't think this is going to be a particularly long painting session today. But I wanted to get some things done. He needs to sit and dry for a little bit. I think my mechs are all done, so they're, yeah, they're dry on the bottom. this is going on real bright. What I've found with red is that it tends to go on very bright. It doesn't stay as bright. And that's one reason why I actually started with a much darker red is so that um, I won't lose the brighter red completely. sort of uh, built my shading in already. Yeah, see, you can see it went on very, very bright. It did not stay that way.
I just kind of love the way the red it starts out so bright and then fades for this because it's the perfect color once I've layered the brighter blood red over the like dark burgundy. The only thing I'm not thrilled with is that I sort of overpainted the white here and so it's staying super bright. play around with that a little bit to get that to look right. So the cool thing about the iridescence of a peacock feather is that it's not just like, oh, it's shimmery and blue or it's shimmery and green, but it's a little bluish, it's a little greenish, and that's a little black. So what we're going to do here is do a blue-green metallic. So this is like a blue metallic and a green metallic mixed together. Um, and then... We're going to do a black wash over it after the fact. Yeah.
And then if you look at the actual like fancier peacock feathers, they've got a lot of parts to them. They're not just like, oh, it's shiny green. They've got like a dark blue eye to them. What they have is like a cobalt blue right in like the center, and then they have a brown, um, which I think is really interesting. So you can see I sort of did the blue and then a little touch of the brown around the eyes on these. So we're going to be doing that. I, like I said, I could just do it and leave it like that, but um, we're, we're going to keep going with it. We're going to darken it down. Um, let's see. Next I want to do, yeah, I'm going to do his hat. Because I want to get his hat ready. Hey Andy, if you're watching, um, I'm probably going to finish up in a little bit, maybe 20 minutes. So we've got um, one of them has a heavy flame that looks like uh, hang on a minute, so we have that any more. <coughs>
There we go. do that color. Not happy with that. I think I want that to be ruddy leather, but that's okay. We'll do a base coat with the mahogany. I can always go back over it.
dry. I'm going to do some basic base coating for the Kurgan. It's time. So he's going to need some brown, some tan under here, some gray on his cloak. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you get it. I waited a couple 
Everybody coming? coming really well. I'm really pleased. Um, I was going to do some basing on the Kurgan, but I think I'll finish up. Okay. And uh, yeah, Imam Fasil is done. Um, Connor is coming along. He needs a little bit of detail work. You can sort of see between the two mm -hmm. um, that he's got a lot more shading and detail work on him. He's still a little raw. Got a lot of work done on the tart, though. Oh, yeah. And um, we did a lot of work on Ramirez here. He's got oh, yeah. his base coat on his, his uh, cloak. Yeah. He's got his red uh, outfit on. So next is the yellow detailing and yeah. the embroidery and the detail work on the feathers. And then his face, you can see that his face, I gave him a little goatee and stuff. So mm -hmm. got to do that. So yeah, and then we'll, we'll work on uh, the Kurgan next. Yeah. So yeah. Detail work on Connor and Ramirez next, and basing, and a little bit of detail and wash on the Kurgan. So we'll, we'll do that next time, my mom, which may be later this week. So, thanks for joining us. Bye.